Niall Horan, I'm happy to say, is is back on cue. Nice to see you again. Good to see you. I remember our last interview very, very fondly. Well, is that so? Yes, we had a great time. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's good to be back. Actually, in this the place where you do it, because last time it was just in a room in Massey Hall. Yeah, it was backstage at Massey Hall down in the basement. I yep. remember that very well. Mm-hmm. I feel like you have a you you have an affection for Canada or Canadians in general. Yeah, I do. Um, I feel there's a couple of countries where I feel most at home, and it's. I feel it makes sense because I feel like Australians, Canadians, Irish, mm. um, anything of a Celtic nature, we uh, we we get on pretty well. I think. I remember last time you said uh, Tom Power. <laughs> That's the most Irish name I've ever heard in my entire life. <laughs> and then I asked you where you were from. And I said, you were like, no, I'm from Newfoundland. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know I sounded like Father Ted. I had, I had no idea. Um, so I, I want to talk about the last time we chatted. Yeah. So we were backstage at Massey Hall. You had just dropped your debut album, Flickr. Mm-hmm. It was 2017. And you know, what we talked about was how excited you were to be on your own. And you kind of confided to me on air, so you didn't really confide to me, but you said to me <laughs> that um, you were a bit freaked out by it. Mm-hmm. So looking back, I, I got to start by asking, how did it go? It went all right in the end. Um, I, at that time, I was still very early into playing shows on my own for the first time, going around the world, doing everything on my own, promo, interviews, TV, radio, getting up on stage. Everything was new to me. I was only about five or six gigs in when I'd seen you. Um, since then, a lot has changed and just feel just feels more at home now. Is that just so? Feel, just feels more comfortable, yeah. I, um, obviously, like any new thing, it's just going to be odd, isn't it, for a little bit until you get to grips with it that, you know, there's all the pressures on you and every interview you do, you have to answer every question and all of that stuff. And then when you get into that, then ready to go. And what was what was something surprising about it, something you weren't expecting about touring by yourself? Um... I liked being the front man. That was good crack. <laughs> and I, <laughs> no, I did. I, I went to see the show that night. Yeah, and I was oh, sorry, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I was nervous, like, oh, like still, by the, at then. Uh, I don't know how you, what you thought of it, but I was okay at the time. I'll give you my notes later. All right, cheers. <laughs> <laughs> no, I <laughs> loved that, it. It was that's great. That's the after part of this. Yeah, it was really good. I enjoyed it. Things have changed. I definitely, like, I'm more confident on the stage. Like, running, running a show for 90 minutes is not the easiest thing to do, but I think I've got my arm around it a little bit more these days. I want to talk a little bit about the new record. I want to talk mm-hmm. about some of the new songs. Before I do that, though, I do want to go back a little tiny bit. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm going to give you something. That I don't think it'll be too hard to listen to, but I want to brace you for it. Just take a listen to this. I'm Niall Horan. I'm 16. I'm Turn it off. Mullingar in the Midlands of Ireland. <laughs> I want to be like big names in the world, like Beyonce. You can take your headphones Justin Bieber is a perfect yeah. example. I've been, I've been compared to him a few times. And we shall it's not, not a bad comparison. I want to sell out arenas and make an album and work with some of the, the best artists Headphones are down. What's your name? Nile. All right, bring it down, bring it down, bring it down. Boo. Why? Why do you have such an unfortunate... There's nothing worse to listen to yourself at 15 years old, is there really? <laughs> However, it's not every day, not everyone can have the experience of listening to a second <laughs> that their lives changed. Like, yeah, yeah. most of us don't have recordings of the time we met our wives <laughs> or the recordings of the day we were born. That's true. But it is kind of like that, right? I suppose so, yeah. I mean, listening to your own voice most of the time is pretty painful. Um, but listening to stuff like that is, yeah, it's pretty crazy. Like, there, that was literally it, isn't it? That was the first interview I did on the TV show. I said some things, and a lot of them have come through. <laughs> true. Yeah. And... Uh, yeah, hindsight is an unbelievable thing. Does it does it even feel like it actually happened though? Like I I feel mm. like I'm speaking to you now. Um, you know, can I? How many years removed from the band? Uh, on the uh, I don't know what the term Four is. Four or five. We'll say it? on the break from the band. Yeah, yeah. Does it feel like it even happened? Like how do you? Oh yeah, like of course. I mean, I wouldn't be sitting here if we didn't do it. Um, it's just uh, that feels decades ago. It, it to be fair, like it nearly is ten years. <laughs> Um, that's crazy because I'm only 26, so it shows how young I was when I started. Um, yeah, it definitely happened. It was, a, I mean, it's an absolute whirlwind. What I'm doing now is completely different than what, what it was like. Well, can we listen to some of the stuff he's doing right now? Take a listen to this. Mm-hmm. I like the way you talk. I like the things you wear. I want your number tattooed on my arm in ink, I swear. Because when the morning comes, I know you won't be there. Every time I turn around, you disappear. 
That is Niall Horan, and nice to meet you on Woo. Q. Uh, co-written by Canadian, by the way, British Columbia's own Tobias Jesso Jr. Yes, love that man. Um, well, yeah, he's quite the character, Tobias, for those of you who don't know him. Um, he's I've never met him, you know. Is it really? Yeah. Canadian. He's like there. a big Labrador, a big happy Labrador, bangs around the place, um, and he's very Canadian and very lovely and when we get in the room together there's just something that happens I don't know what it is but we haven't written a bad song yet I don't think um, and yeah, he, we did Slow Hands together um, we wrote another couple of tunes and another few tunes on, from this album that will you'll probably hear the, that will probably get the light of day mm-hmm. and this one as well yeah we, we had a lot of fun he's, he's very good for when you know you're having writer's block and he is he's the man that gets the room buzzing again. So tell um, me tell me about writing that song. What did you guys have to talk about? Yeah, well, we, we kind of we kind of came out of nowhere. It was one of those ones where nothing's happening and we were in the studio just kind of sitting around and we'd written a lot of songs that week and we were just going to kind of coming in because we had a session. <laughs> and um, and then I just started playing that riff out of nowhere. The and then everyone's ears perked up and... Tobias went over and played that kind of dancey piano straight away. That, and it's still the same piano now, actually, that's on the recording than why he did at the time. And then we just went for it. And kind of like we did in Slow Hands, where you find a tempo, you find a bit of... There's something about it that you know you don't have to overthink the lyric. You know, you don't have to dig really deep. I literally picked up a mic that looks a bit like yours. Mm-hmm. SM7. Mm-hmm. I think that one is, with I a got, big head. I get the nice one. <laughs> Cheers, yeah. I, did, I didn't get a very nice one. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, pick that up and just like, nice to meet you. Um, there's voice notes somewhere, I don't know where they are. But um, there's a lot of screaming and shouting and not. So when I get asked about the lyric in this song now, I just kind of like don't really know what to say because it's one of those lyrics that you just open your mouth and things happened. I mean, that's how Kerouac wrote, right? That's how mm. a lot of the beats wrote. There was something yeah. they, they call it generative poetry. You exactly. Know, you, you open your mouth and see what comes out. And I prefer it that way. But what's interesting about it is, and we don't have to get into this, mm. but what's interesting about it is when you do something like that, because I've done stuff like that, then you have to listen back to it and say, oh God, what, what, what's on my mind right now? I know. No, <laughs> then you have to start thinking actually what we're we going to write about because, you know, uh, to be fair, we'd written a lot of songs up until that point, you know, I, at that point, I'd probably written fifty songs, mm. um, and you know, you're, you're. Uh, we were having one of those days where nothing was happening, and then it kicked off, and then I start. Then you start thinking, I'm like, nice to meet you. It sounds quite like inner city, you know. Mm. It sounds urban, and the whole feel of the song was starting to feel nineties and eighties and nineties like tune, like Fat Boy Slim vibes. I'm, I'm here, and and then I just kind of started messing around with the lyric and and being really kind of like what we did, slow hands, I guess. Cause, you know, it's just like. No one really knows what it means, but we just go for it. Did you see the movie Snatch? Yeah, I love it. It feels like it could be on the soundtrack for Snatch, but man. That's exactly what I said. Um, oh, really? Yeah. No, actually, the first thing I said was it could be on FIFA. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like it sounds like one of those songs that's on the menu when you're choosing your team. Right. Um, and then I was like, it feels like it could be in a Guy Ritchie Tarantino. That's why I, I shot the video the way I did. If you don't mind me saying so, it's a, it's a far cry from the music I first heard. You yeah. know that clip we didn't listen to? Uh, <laughs> it's, it's a far cry from the music that you were making back then. Uh, what are you listening to these days? Um, well, the fir- well, the first album, I, that's exactly what I wanted to do that, with that kind of music. And this stuff, I kind of, I'm always like trying to get something out of my influences. People always ask me what I'm listening to, and it's never anything new, to be honest. Yeah, well, um, tell me. Um, Listen, man, I play the banjo. Like you're not gonna, you know. That's it's, true. Yeah, it's yeah, not like yeah. I'm. It's not like I'm sitting here listening to Billie Eilish. You know, like don't don't worry about it. I you know? love. I do love. Billie I Eilish love Billie. She was right there not that long ago. Really, she's yeah. the coolest person to ever watch. She the wore four watches. Really? Yeah. But well, I'm sorry, you only have the one on, Tom. Um, <laughs> <laughs> bit of a letdown. <laughs> Wasn't going to say anything. Yeah. Um, uh, big shame. But yeah. um, but, I, but the reason I ask is is not just simply because I want your Spotify playlist, but <laughs> because I'm, I'm hearing and I, I can't actually put my my finger on what I'm listening to there. Like I'm hearing 90s British music. Mm. I'm hearing sort of rock. I'm even hearing 80s, 70s music. Yeah. So like what, what were you listening to around the time? Because it just says to me something that when you started playing, that's what came out, you, mm. you know? I suppose when I wrote that, what was I listening to then? I was listening to quite a bit of U2 at the start of this year for some reason. I really got into, because I went to watch, um, I went to watch the, the gig, their, their latest tour, where they did, um, what was going on with me now? What's the name of that place in California? Los Angeles? <laughs> no, the album that's called... Oh, do you know? Um, Joshua, Joshua Tree. Tree. Oh, sorry, you. I literally went blank there. Andrew Alba, everybody. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good job, by the way. Yeah, I was listening to Joshua Tree and 
And then I was also listening to the stuff that I did like in my teens, like Kasabian, mm. um, the Kooks, the Fratellis, um, Razorlight, kind of things like that. And and those r- types of riffs are something that I would naturally play anyway. I would like pick up if I was checking if my guitar was in tune, I would play a riff of some sort like that. Um, literally one finger, a couple of <laughs> two fingers and a one string, one of those riffs. Um, and it just, yeah, that's the kind of stuff that I, I, I listen to quite a lot. Like the, the harder rock stuff is something that I would listen to quite generally. Does it feel like a risk to be making this kind of music? Yeah, of course. I like it. And I like the risk. Um, why, why, what makes it a risk? Because it's nothing like anything else that I'm up against. Um, when I, I, and sometimes I kind of go out of my way, but not in a rebellious, like, oh, I hate pop music. Because um, I don't. I love pop music. But I do appreciate people that try and do something different. That's why Billie Eilish is so successful right now, because she sounds nothing like anything else. She sounds Billie Eilish, and that is it. And that can be said over the history of music. There's no music like it, um, and it won't be for a while either. And and I'm not saying that I'm like Billie Eilish, but I do appreciate what she does. Like she goes out of her way to be different, and I, and I and and I really like that. And when I'm looking, when I'm sitting like at the start of the record. And I'm having a fair idea of where what I want to try out, what kinds of sounds I want to go into. I look at like charts and radio charts and you know all the Amazon, Spotify, and Apple, and all the all the different vendors of, so you, of music. So you are listening to sort of like what's happening. Yeah, we'll have a look at it, and then uh, and then I'm like, yeah, well, I'm gonna do try and do something completely different, but it's still in my flavor in yeah. that rocky thing. Because I think I, the way I think the way, the reason I think like that is because the the success of Slow Hands made me think like that. That was a that was a groundbreaking song, hey. Like I, I feel like that song gave you confidence. Hundred percent. Because I like a song like that. I keep saying it, and I keep getting asked about it. But a song like that shouldn't have really been successful at that period, and even now, you know, it, it, you know, it had no right to because at the moment in um, in our charts, it's. Heavily dominated by pop and or R and B and hip hop, um, and it's having it's having a real period again, R and B and hip hop. So, I when something comes along like Slow Hands, it, I guess in the end it's a like it, when you look at it, when you're putting it out, you're scared and it's a risk. But I think it stood out, and that's why people like, attached onto it, and hopefully to do the same here. Can, can you help me and only only tell me what you want to tell me here? Because I know it's it's a it's kind of hard to talk about, and two, I don't know how much you can really say. But I obviously don't know what it's like to come out of a big band like One Direction. This kind of, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know if you guys are a boy band. I don't really want to call you a boy band, but you know, yeah. like you come out of this pop band that mm-hmm. One, One Direction are. I don't really understand the pressure of what it takes to stay come out by yourself because I think you want to be you want to be faithful. You want to kind of have some audience that you you, you had when you were there, mm-hmm. right? You want to make sure to keep them around. It's just meaningful to me that this record is so different. That this record is so rock, this record is so kind of unique mm-hmm. from what you were doing. Am I on to something that it's a little hard when you when you leave the confines of the band to 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 start all over again to kind of know what you're going to sound like to take those kind of risks? Um, the fir- definitely not the first album. I knew exactly how that was going to sound. I've known that since I was about ten. You know, I knew that when I was playing. When I was 13 and I was in the pubs playing gigs, they, it was just me and an acoustic guitar. I knew that that was. How it was going to be? What, first, were, you, what were you playing? Songs like songs like I was speaking about, and then kind of like bits of Dylan and bits of McCartney, and cause I was playing to like fifty year old men, you know, in, in the pub. <laughs> um, I had to be out by about eight o'clock because I got put out because I was too young. Um, but I was kind of playing stuff, you know, like the usual, the usual stuff. And then um, yeah, I kind of I had a fair idea of what like that was going to sound like. Um, second album, I knew that I was going to step up in terms of tempo. And that is all I knew at the time. I was going to try out loads of different things, but I knew that I needed more tempo. And because I toured for so long, I basically toured since I met you until September last year. So a good year and a bit of touring. Mm -hmm. And you learn just by looking at the crowd every night, what comes next. You look at the crowd, you see the faces of people, you know when they cry, you know when they jump up and down, you know when they want to rip the roof off, and I, I, I'm the one that sets the set list, so I know where the moments are. And then I'm going to want to walk into the studio after the success of it, right? I'm like, I'm going to ramp this up, and you walk in with a chest out and go for it. I tell you what I love about that 
is that uh, little Steven from the E Street Band. Have you ever met him? No, I haven't. I've never met him. Right, okay. But I don't know. In your world, man, I, could, I assume, like, <laughs> you I assume know, he's on speed dial or something like that, right? <laughs> so speed dial, is that it's still a thing? Yeah, maybe. Well, it's a, still a phrase. I don't know if it's a thing. I don't know if it's a thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he said, but he said that the secret of Bruce Springsteen is that he writes these incredible, beautiful, introspective, gorgeous mm-hmm. songs, but he never forgets about what the audience needs. Oh, yeah. And I think you saw me when you were telling me that story. kind of pumped yeah, my yeah. fist. <laughs> because... I would understand that if you want, you know, if you were writing these songs and you were like, I want to, you know, I want to communicate artistically, and I think you did. I think that's really important. Mm. But I love how putting on a show and making people dance, and you, you, you said everyone seems to be grooving, but they need something to dance to a little bit more. Mm. Your, your audience, you really do care about them. They're, they're what's on your mind. I mean, they're the ones that have to listen to it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. really, they are. Yeah. They, they well, are. to be fair, it's funny that you mentioned E Street. Uh, I went to watch Bruce on Broadway, in his, on his show, and I've and I've read. I kind of wish I didn't read the book because it gave away the show. <laughs> um, but uh, when, I, when I was listening to that, he was like, he actually, he named loads of songs that he'd written about what they were about, political, um, factory workers, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, I've talked about stuff that I've never even done in my life. Mm. He said, I've written songs, I've never had a job in my life. I've mm-hmm. never worked in a factory, I've never worked in a car plant, I've never done any of this and I've made a career out of writing about it and I, <laughs> I, when, I, when I heard him say that I was like this is brilliant because that is a man that just knows what's going on around him mm-hmm. knows that he can get up and play for three and a half hours sing those songs to people and never want to get off stage even if you are 65 or whatever he is yeah um, and I and I re- uh, that really resonated with me and it was more as well uh, like I was always like very like oh I'm so rootsy and like you know let's play live kits and let's be Let's be really rootsy about it. And then my producer, Julian Bonetta, said to me, he was like, people just, people want to dance. People want to be in bars and clubs and at concerts and get up and dance with a beer in their hand. And, and you know, they obviously want to have their moments where they cry their eyes out in gigs. And that's what, that's what is great about having a set list, that you can do that. But at the end of the day, people want to get up. And, and, and it's so true. And it, it really, you know, it really got me fired up and every time I went into the studio I just felt like something good was going to happen how old are you now if you don't mind me asking huh how old are you now 20, 26 yeah 26. just turned yeah I feel like you've you've sort of avoided a stage in your life which could have been kind of poisonous you know you and I talked a little bit last time which I really appreciated you, t- you told me stories about like hey man you know it's not easy to it was a little scary at times when I was just kind of this kid from Mongar <laughs> and because it was pretty overnight, right? Like mm. one day you were anonymous, you were able to go to Tesco <laughs> and, you know, you were able to go to... Your knowledge of home is just too good. Uh, right? you, were, you, you, were, you were able to get a LucasAid. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> this guy is good. Uh, and, and head down the road. But really, it's overnight, right? Yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah. the next day you can't walk down the street. Yeah. No, that would all pretty much uh, kicked off. And to be fair, in the last 18 months, two years, it's definitely died down. Like until about a half an hour ago when I was live on TV. <laughs> I don't think anyone knew I was even in the country, which is good. Um, you know, and and, and it's kind of... I kind of like the idea of being the normal 26-year-old that does an, an abnormal job. Like, the idea of being able to walk down the street to me is a little bit more... Uh, is a little bit better, better of an idea in my head than it used to be. Um, I used to probably just become a bit of a hermit and kind of stay in because of the fear of going out. It probably wouldn't have been that bad if I'd gone out, but the fear of going out was worse than actually probably being out. Now I can, you know, I can waltz the streets and have a look at the cities that I'm going to and appreciate them for what they were instead of them just being another place that you get off a plane and go to a hotel. And, and, and bear with me here, but I feel like that can lead to a lot of dangerous things. You know, a lot of people who find themselves in your situations find themselves turning to drugs, mm. t- turning to severe alcohol addiction. You yeah. know as well as I do, we don't have to say any names, the people who have found themselves yeah. in your situations haven't ended up squeaky clean on the way out or haven't ended up as, yeah. as kind of healthy as you are coming out of this. What do you, what, what do you attribute that to? I don't know. Um your folks, or yeah, you know, no, the way the way we're brought up is a one hundred percent a factor to everything. And um, people always, I know it's not a very humble thing to say, but people always mention the fact of how humble I am uh, for what I've been through and whatever. I'm the humblest person in the world. Yeah, yeah. I'm so <laughs> humble. You have no idea. <laughs> anyway, sorry, please go and, on. And yeah, and, and I don't know. I guess there's a very Irishness. I always mention it. There's a big Irish thing to that. You know, the way we're brought up. There's no, there's no. You don't. No one's too fond of themselves, or you don't get on your high horse, or and if you do, you get slapped down 
by anyone around you, whether it be a family or a friend. And it, I, I would put it down a lot of it down to that. Um, uh, also, it just depends on the type of person you are in general, like it, how you deal with it. Like, I, you know, you can go you can go two ways with all of it. You know, it can be detrimental to you, or it can be the, f- the most fun thing. And I just always see myself, and I've been thinking about it a lot because I got asked about it the other day. Another Bruce thing, you know, he was saying about the first time he got his guitar. I, by the way, I don't know if you noticed, but I'm pretty obsessed with Bruce Springsteen. <laughs> but when I, you know, when he was saying he got his first guitar and he stood in the mirror when he was 12 years old, or and he was like pretending he was Elvis and you know wanted to be the rock star, and he still sees himself as that now. You know that even though he's 60, what was he 68 or something? And he's the biggest rock star in the entire world. <laughs> I know, and then I, I still like. I know I'm not nowhere near Bruce, but that resonates with me. Like every time. I still dance in the mirror I'm like Kevin from Home Alone, you know? like you know, dancing around and and pretending that I'm Bruce Springsteen. I mean, as much as we didn't listen to it, you're still kind of that 16 year old kid auditioning mm. on X Factor. You yeah. still are. You, you you know, like we don't. <laughs> what did someone say to me? Like, it doesn't just you don't just make it. You never think that you actually made it. Yeah, right? no, you know? well, that's a lot of the time. That's when people go mad is when they believe that they have. And 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 do you think that Ed Sheeran is going to stop tomorrow morning? Because he's done stadiums, no, no, and you just get fired up because someone there's someone ahead of you that has what you want, and you're going to try and track them down. And the minute you lose that is the minute you go mad. Bono, is that is that yours? Huh? Is Bono yours? Is that who you're going after? I don't know. Just any of them. Like I'm good friends with Ed, and I'm you know I'm good friends with some of these guys that are doing well now, and you, you you're half jealous of them. You know you want you want to be there or you want to be at the award shows with them. And you want to be on the same stages as them, and yeah, just that, that alone gets you fired up to write better songs. I want to ask you about one of your songs. Can you talk about "Put a Little Love on Me"? Yes, I'd love to. Um, I got a guitar there if you want to play it. <laughs> just t- t- tell me a little bit about it. Um, I tuned up my high action Taylor for you. Here, oh, it looks way. lovely, by the way. I like the finish. Um, it's okay. It's okay. Yeah. Uh, the start is better. <laughs> <laughs> I love your honesty. Um, I this song kind of came about just gone through a breakup um, and I just had I had to have a I've been having problems with my sinuses for a long time so I had to have a sinus surgery when I came off tour oh jeez yeah it was just kind of like I get, like it was affecting my voice and stuff like that and that's a scary surgery for a singer yeah I oh, know to be fair to f- like it is nervous and to be honest I didn't really know he didn't really tell me much about what he was actually going to do when he got in there because I didn't really want to know because that's that kind of Anywhere in there kind of freaks you out a little bit. Yeah. But he does a lot of singers and, you know, he's done Charlie Puth and he did Sean's and Sean Mendes and he did a few of the lads. So I, I, I trust him. Mm-hmm. And anyway, so I did that. And then I couldn't really leave the house for a couple of weeks because it was in case of catching infection or whatever. So, and I had planned on taking a lot of time off. And even if, you know, when you're sick, you don't even want to do anything anyway. And then I just seen the piano in the corner. Where were you? This one was in LA, yeah, it was mm-hmm. in the house in LA, and the piano was in the corner of the sitting room, and I just went over and, and you know, just... The, the first thing I wrote down when I started um, was a phrase that you'll hear soon when I release more about the album, and it was the first thing I wrote down, and I knew that I wanted to write songs that matched, that were, matched all of the feelings that you have when you go through a breakup, whether it be songs like Nice to Meet You, where you're clearly out with your friends, messing around, 26 years old, do what I want, when I want. And then you also have them days where you're like, this is horrible. And the phrase, put a little love on me, just came to, came to mind in my feeling sorry for myself state. And I just sat down and I tried to like Elton John it a little bit and played, started playing some cool minor chords and like being quite melodic about how, how I was writing the song. And every lyric, I was trying to tie lyrics from old songs of mine into it. And I actually have one in this one where in in a song called Too Much To Ask, in my first album, I say, my shadow's dancing without you for the first time. And in this song, I say, when the lights come on and there's no shadows dancing. So I, trying to, I was trying to be a little bit clever and try and tie these songs, these ballads together a little bit, even if they're not about the same thing. But just like a very honest, I, as you know, I like to write a ballad. So the sitting down. You like to write a ballad? I mean, we all love being sad. That's what I've realized about this. People love to talk about ballads, want to know what they're about, Mm -hmm. love listening to them. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's a man I love Celine Dion. That's the reason. I mean, don't get me started on her. We could be here for a long time. (laughs) (laughs) But I just sat down and just started. I find them a lot easier to write than the up-tempo ones. Just kind of let it go. 
just open your mouth, see what comes out. And then, yeah, just got going. And it, the, I tried to like get it produced by a couple of different people. And what I ended up realizing was the magic was in the first take. And the first take of the piano and the first take of the, the vocal that I ever did are the original, are, are on track now. I tried to redo the piano, redo the vocal, and there's something magic about this song in my mind. And someone said it's my career song where it's the best song that I've ever written <laughs> or the best song I've ever written, but the most emotive song I've ever written. And I like it. I like I like writing sad songs and I'm glad people like this one so far. And do you agree with it? Yeah. I, I, there's something in this song that, gives, that just still... Get crawls the skin. Oh, which is great. We'll, we'll, we'll get him to sing some. I mean, we can't not hear him. We'll figure something out. We'll figure something out. I'll guess what it sounds like or something like that. I play you a little piano, maybe. Oh, who knows? Maybe we'll get to the microphone. Up. Nice to <laughs> uh, nice to talk to you. I do. I do. Just have a it's couple a shame of... when this is over. I don't like it. You don't want. Do you want to keep going? Yeah, come on, talk to me for five more minutes. Come on. F- five more minutes. That yeah. was what you meant. I thought you were going to take another three hours or something like that. Well, I mean, I can see people looking through windows. Oh, I've been looking. I've been looking up there too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I can see. There's a laser pointer trained in my head right now. <laughs> <laughs> You don't know, right? Poor old Tom Powers getting the dagger eyes. <laughs> if that <laughs> doesn't stop talking to that guy in his feigned Newfoundland accent, he's from Toronto. Don't let him lie to you. I uh, love it. Do me a favor. That kid who I played that clip from that we didn't yeah, listen to. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I didn't. You did. What would you... Uh, no, you played it. Uh, well, you were him, for Christ's sake. If it wasn't for you, we wouldn't have it. Fair enough. What would you tell him? What would you tell him about the road he's about to embark on? <laughs> Oh, it's nuts. It's going to be crazy. They have no idea what's ahead of you, son. Um, and be, I don't even... It's so hard to like even stick a finger on it because it's something that I don't really... Some things feel like they were yesterday. Some feel things feel like they were 10 years ago or 20 years ago even because it was 10 years ago. But um, just get ready because it's... Some of it is exactly what you think it is and most of it's not. And, you know, I had a, when you're a kid and you have a, a view of what it looks like from, you know, you go to a gig and how would they enter the stage? You know, blah, blah, blah. I mean, it's not as glamorous as it looks, no, first of all. There's a lot of times. Whoever said that the music industry looked glamorous, it happens about four times a year when you step on a red carpet. <laughs> <laughs> but behind that red carpet is just a piece of wood holding up a sheet that has a sponsor on it. Yeah, and a, and a fruit tray. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, get ready to eat a lot of hummus and carrot sticks <laughs> and, and three bottles of water. Um, I know, just get ready because what's ahead of you, you've got no idea. And... You're just going to have to take it step by step and handle it. And when I sit here now, nine or ten years later, whatever it is, I I feel like I did an all right job at handling it. And hopefully I can handle it at this level for a very long time, Tom. I I think so, too. It's been nice talking to you. Before before I let you go, Mm. I'm sure you're going to get a lot of questions today about whether the band's going to get back together or anything like that. Not really really my, my, Mm. my gig, as you know. Yeah. But I'll tell you one thing I will say is that I've listened to what each of you guys have done. Mm-hmm. Um, I've never seen a band do so many different things. Mm. Like each band member made a completely different record from one another. Yeah, true, yeah. So when the time comes that you guys do maybe sit back down together and make music, mm-hmm. I'm really excited to hear what it's going to sound like. I can't imagine what a guy who yeah. likes Bruce Springsteen, a guy who likes David <laughs> Bowie, a guy who likes trap music. Uh, you, know, you can guess who I'm talking about yeah, it's there. It's quite, quite the combo, isn't it? I'm, I'm, I'm excited to see what you guys do again, if you ever do it again. Yeah, no, it, to be fair, that was what was always fun, was we always had the, like different types of music, and we kind of set at early doors that we were kind of like a pop rock. There was always, We always had a guitar edge to our thing, and took a few albums to get that perfected. I think the last couple of albums was clearly a solid sound and probably quite underrated. If you listen to those albums again, I was actually listening to one of them recently, the latest one, and there's some great sounds on it. Um, and I feel like, well, yeah, I think you just kind of have to pick up from where you left off if you go again, yeah. I just think it's underrated because if young women like music, they people, I, I think Harry was right. If, women, yeah. if young women don't, if young women like it, hip, cool people have to say they don't. I mean, it's just ridiculous. Like, uh, I mean, the, the truth is, in every aspect of culture, young people, young men, women, whatever you may be, have so much power. We've seen it with, like, in America, with all the political stuff, with you know, the the economics situation and all of that stuff. They're, it's the young kids that are. You got like a twelve-year-old from Sweden dominating mm-hmm. the, the news. <laughs> I mean, 
young people are the ones with the power and they've shown that for so many years the young people always pick up on something and, and really go with it when they get it it's nice to talk to you thanks for coming you too in. Tom good to see you nice to see you too Niall Horan's sophomore record I've got a sweaty record. hand would you like to it's shake called, it I'll shake it so Niall Horan's <laughs> sophomore record will be out soon his new single's called Nice to Meet You here it is <laughs>